Genevieve Gregson, the most accomplished middle distance woman in Australian history. Record holder, three-time Olympian and dual Olympic finalist. She is someone that will overcome any obstacle in front of her. And this is her story. Well, thank you for joining me today, Genevieve. My name's Ali, host of Something in the Grey. Um, I guess where we can start today is I know you had rehab this morning. So tell me about uh, that and how that's been going. Yeah, no, thanks for having me, Ali. I'm excited to be here. Um, I'm actually yesterday, eight weeks into um, post-op progress. Nice. Uh, it's traveling really well. I, I would say that the early days were definitely the hardest when I was really immobile and, and mm. in a cast and on crutches, but it's exciting now where I am. Um, I got out of a boot yesterday, so I went and saw nice. the doctors um, got approved to get out of the boot. So I'm back on crutches, but walking around in a shoe, which is really nice. And yeah, every day we're, we're hitting little milestones. So I'm actually on cloud nine of late because awesome. I feel like I'm actually on the road to recovery. That's good to hear. That's very good to hear. I know it must have been very difficult because after the Olympics and the injury, you're in isolation. So thinking about mm -hmm. an injury, you always want to surround yourself with people, you know, your support mm -hmm. system. Being in isolation, how did you deal with the first the isolation itself is difficult, but having an injury where you're not as mobile, how did you deal with that? Yeah, I was really fortunate. Um, pretty much as soon as I uh, injured myself, we got the ball rolling of, of you know, what the next few weeks were going to look like. And of course, surgery was something in my very near future at the time. Um, and I spoke with all the medical team uh, that were there for the Australian team in Tokyo. And they were so helpful with just getting the ball rolling, organizing my flight, you know, getting me uh, to Melbourne, which was where I was going to get my surgery. Um, but they also organized my husband to get home from London, who was also competing in London at the time. Um, and, and flights were almost impossible, but they helped get him home awesome. to look after me in um, isolation because at the t most of the time I was actually bedridden. Um, obviously, mm. even going to the bathroom was difficult. So if I didn't have my husband there helping me like eat and, and picking up the meals at the door and just all the really little stuff you don't think about, um, I would have really struggled. It was almost like I needed a nurse uh, for those two weeks, but um, we got through it together. I had a lot of phone calls. I spent most of the time speaking to people um, because at that point I felt like I dealt with the injury uh, physically, but emotionally, yeah, I was reaching out for support. Um, you know, I probably cried every second day in isolation, just Very kind fair. of, yeah, getting, getting over it. But I felt like by the time those two weeks were up, I was ready to come out and see everyone and, and, you know, do more interviews and kind of face the reality of, mm -hmm. of what, you know, what was my, what my next few years were going to look like. Yeah. Cause obviously I was listening to a podcast you had been on previously and it seems like you're quite meticulous with your planning. You would, in your notes, three months ahead, you would get straight to it, but it can be quite difficult. You know, it's quite a crazy time, volatile time these days in terms of lockdowns and isolation. Mm -hmm. How did you take that into consideration with your recovery? Yeah, um, well, that was uh, pretty much my main reason to get straight to Queensland. Mm -hmm. I just thought, you know, when I'm this down and out, um, there's not much I can do. I, I really didn't want to be in Melbourne where none of my family are. I mean, I have my brother, but he's a full-time lawyer, uh, so he doesn't have all the time in the world to, <laughs> to, yeah, to wait on me hand and foot. Mm -hmm. So um, that decision to quickly go straight from hotel quarantine in Melbourne to Queensland was more um, for me mentally. Mm -hmm. uh, once I got to Queensland, I was immediately welcomed by my whole family. Um, we actually redid my birthday since nice. when I ruptured my Achilles on my birthday. That yes, wasn't the most course. memorable one. So we redid yes. a party and that was the first step, I think, for me to recover was just feeling um, comfort emotionally and, and knowing that despite my running dreams being completely smashed, um, I, you know, there was so much to be proud of and so much to look forward to in, in my future. But from there, it's it's been a blessing in disguise. I, I went straight to the QAS, which is the Queensland Academy of Sport, and um, they have just to the day, uh, like structured my whole rehab. I've been in there every single day, Monday to Friday. They've pretty much told me exactly what I'm doing every hour of the day. And it's just been really nice to take the thinking out of 
mm. out of it all. Like, like you said earlier, I am a person that like sits and writes down notes of exactly how the next few months are going to look. And with an Achilles rupture, it is really difficult. It's, it's, a, it's one you have to be really careful yeah. with and it's easy to make mistakes. So <laughs> I kind of put all my faith into other people to write the right program. And I've pretty much just been following following the lead and um, I'm so happy eight weeks in of, of how I'm progressing and how I feel just um, physically and emotionally awesome. I feel like I'm in a, a stable place and um, I'm still as motivated as ever to get to where I'm trying to go and although it's a long road ahead um, it's definitely uh, not daunting at all for me awesome no, I'm happy to hear that um, like you were saying you're quite meticulous with the planning has it been difficult to I guess relinquish that control when it comes to the rehab journey yeah uh the physio at the qas laughs at me every time because he says i do his job for him you know i come in there with 101 questions and he's like good question i'm gonna have to get back to you on that but yeah, no. you know I, as much as i say i'm giving them the control i still have a very controlled environment um just yeah. for myself and my sanity so you know most nights before bed i will sit down and I'll, I'll check my steps in my app to make sure that i'm not overdoing it with my achilles and i'll write down what tomorrow is going to look like just so i don't miss um, you know, a scheduled doctor's meeting or a physio appointment. So I'm still controlling everything that I can. Um, and then when it comes to the, the details of the rehab, I'm trusting that the people um, that are, you know, looking after me know exactly what they're doing and I trust them. So, um, so far, so good. No, that's good to hear. I'm actually a physio myself. So having, oh, wow. yeah, having a client that's engaged in the rehab and is motivated mm -hmm. makes a huge difference um and yeah. keeps us on our toes that's for sure if they're always <laughs> yeah. asking, to make sure that we're up to date with everything um but that's great to hear that you got physios and things like that that are pretty on top of things i know that you've mm -hmm. had a previous history of injuries um mm -hmm. as far as i remember it was the diamond league is that correct your first professional yeah. race and then yeah <laughs> that's where it all began run me through that run me through that uh yeah time. well it's, it's actually quite fitting, um, you know, my first major injury and first injury as a professional athlete was a diamond league in Birmingham um, on the water jump. I yes. fell in the water and completely shattered my ankle and all the bones in it. Um, and that was like a rude awakening for me because I was so young. Um, everything had come pretty easy to me at that point. I mean, I worked really hard in training, but I didn't have any niggles. I didn't face um, much adversity. I was very driven, but uh, I, I had no idea what it took to um, really face some obstacles mm. and, and have to stay motivated intrinsically. Um, but then fast forward all the way to 2021. So that was 2013, fast forward to 2021. And I fall in the barrier again at the Olympics in front of the world. Um, I think coming as far as I have prepared me for something like yeah. this. I think if that had happened to the 22 year old back in 2013, um, I don't know how I would have dealt with it. Yeah. It would have been really difficult. Um, but now, like, like I said, I was obviously overwhelmed and emotional at, at the loss of an opportunity. And, and the first thing you think of is all that hard work. I mean, there's hours and hours that you think imagine. back to, you know, for the last five years, that is what really, you know, was heart wrenching for me. Um, but the thought of rehabbing another injury, even though this may be the toughest one I ever have, that that wasn't scary for me. I've done it a million times. I mean, since 2013, like you said, I've had, um, you know, continuous stress fractures in different parts of my body. I've had a torn labrum, stress reactions in my hip, um, tendinopathy in most tendons. I've kind of really dealt with a lot of things, but um, that's one thing this sport does. It, it it makes you persevere. It, it makes you resilient. And these are all characteristics in me now that um, I think have helped me just in the world in general. And I'm proud of how I dealt with the Olympics. I mean, it was a tragic way to end, but um, I think that it's just going to make me hungrier for this next phase of my life where I do want to move up to marathons and do a lot of road running. Yeah. We'll definitely touch on that a bit later, but yeah, it must be, I guess, having an injury earlier in your career allows you to lean back on that with this injury. Um, yeah, I guess with the Olympics as well, it's four years preparation for one event or mm -hmm. one opportunity, in this case, five years. And then mm -hmm. for that to happen, how was your, obviously you were saying that your mental health was, you know, you, you were quite emotional afterwards. Mm -hmm. How do you go about shifting that mental space into a more positive way? Because I could imagine, you know, I know I'll be feeling pretty sorry for myself after you work for so long. And then, you know, it's delayed yeah. a year on your own birthday. 
that happens. <laughs> yeah. What an yeah. awful birthday present that is. I know. It How was do you awful. go about changing that up in, in your head? Because I could imagine that would play on you quite a bit. Yeah. I mean, that I think really when you look at it in a nutshell that was the the hardest thing to deal with um I was I didn't once consider the pain of it that is in no way why I was upset or crying um when it first happened I thought of all those things immediately um I thought of my husband watching and thinking oh my gosh this is a nightmare he's gonna die but um it (laughs) was husband if he's feeling that yeah (laughs) yeah he would just be so upset um it was I had to do, think about all those things for the first probably few days, right up until maybe 10 days, two weeks. Mm. You know, I did feel sorry for myself. I did think this is so unlucky. You know, this is really unfortunate. I'm really sad for myself. Yeah, definitely. Um, but, but I think the main key for moving forward for me was I really thought back to every decision I made leading into that Olympic final, because, you know, I'd gone in with Achilles problems on Mm. my other side, which was causing me to compensate and put way too much weight through my right Achilles. And then it had to give, but I went back and I thought of every decision I'd made of recent times and thought, did I make the smartest decision in this point of time to get me to be in the best shape possible and every single like fork in the road that I thought back to where I could have made a 50 50 decision I truly believe even looking back now I did you know what I should have done yeah um and when you're able to weigh it up like that you can't even find somewhere to regret um I I was looking for a regret I was looking for a oh you shouldn't have done that long run when you were sore or you shouldn't have done that race but at the time I made all those decisions, they were the right decisions. And when you can't even pinpoint one thing that you truly believe you did wrong, you can let go of the despair and, and the, mm. the emotion of it all because it, it really was just bad luck. Um, and you can't punish yourself for being unlucky in a situation where it really mattered. Um, It happens all the time. It happens to people. And even though I might think the running gods weren't watching over me that day, I do believe that everything somehow happens for a reason. And and I think it'll make me hungrier and and lead me to another opportunity. Because even in 2013, when I broke my ankle, that led me to meeting and dating my husband now. Um, You know, there's always a a sliding door moment. And um, after many countless um, nights of laying there staring at the ceiling when I, I said to my husband, I don't think I did one thing wrong to put myself in this situation mm. and have a sore Achilles going into the Olympic final. If I had made a decision differently earlier on, maybe I wouldn't even made it this far. So I think in any situation where you're so upset and you're just so down, you have to break it up and really think, you know, did you make a mistake? Do you have any regret? Because if you don't, then it's so easy to move forward. And yeah. I feel like that's what I've been able to do in this situation. That's awesome to hear, especially, yeah, it can be difficult. Sometimes <clears throat> you begin to dwell on the past and that, mm-hmm. those decisions that you think maybe could have gone either way, but it's awesome yeah. to hear that you're at this point and you're looking forward to the rehab journey. And I know you mentioned uh, marathon running. It's a bit different from the current <laughs> sport that you're in. What made you decide yeah. to go down that route? Is that because of the injury or was that a plan that you had prior to um, the injury? I I love road running I always have I actually have so much success on the road I mean just in Australia alone I'm undefeated over the 10k so I think I I really think that my style is is efficient on the road it's got something to do with the shoes that you wear they you know they have more support they absorb the ground better versus this you know very minimal spikes that you wear on a track and just in general, I am a little bit older. This is something I've always wanted to do later in my career, but I never knew when the right time would be for me to, you know, leave my love of track behind and move to the road. So yes, the jump now is is one that was forced on me probably earlier than I originally thought. But at the same time, um, you know, with, with potentially two Achilles surgeries in the near future, because um, I'm, you know, you know, looking at getting this left one worked on, I think my days of running in spikes with, you know, no heel raise, um, jumping over barriers, it's just so much work for your tendon. And yeah. if you if, if you put me on a road in, in the supportive shoes that they have these days, like I'll be good to go. I think I'll be able to do double the mileage and, and I love it. I, I truly awesome. love it. And I think there's so much opportunity for me on the roads and, and one day I want to have a family and it, it's, it's a career that does allow you to have both right now with the track career you're overseas for six seven Mm. months a year because you know the european season starts in may 
and ends in the end of September. So I just think where my life is right now and how my body is, it's, it's an easy decision to make. And yeah. it's one I'm pas- really passionate about. If there was more of a, I guess, <clears throat> cause it seems like in Europe running is a lot bigger of a sport mm-hmm. and then obviously America and Australia, it's not as big. If there was more of a competition and it was a bit more known here, do you think you'd continue on with the, what you're currently doing or do you think it's always the choice to go into the marathon running? Um, I think, yeah, the choice to go into marathon running came from the fact that it is a uh, higher profile to be mm. a really good marathon runner. I think you're, you make more money doing it. Um, there's, there's better opportunities. There's, um, I kind of like the idea that you're not racing every weekend or every second weekend with the yeah. marathon. You, you would probably at most pick two major marathons in a year, maybe three, if you can handle it. And like, that's your focus. And it puts a lot of pressure on the individual races, but there's always another one around the corner. If you Mm -hmm. stuff it up and you have to pull out. Um, But the profile of athletics is unfortunately very low in Australia. And and I wish it was something that was better because we have some amazing track and field athletes that really are just unrecognized. And they're some of our best athletes in the country. Um, so yeah, that, that would be a reason, a little reason of why, um, it's not as tempting to want to stick around, but I am also one of those people that I only want to do something if I can be the best at it. And, um, with the steeple and the pressure that it puts through my body, I just, I don't know at the moment, I can't imagine jumping in that water pit again with two Achilles that have been surgically repaired. Um, so I'm kind of giving myself an option that allows my career to extend longer than people probably thought I would. Yeah, definitely. And like you were saying, maybe physically you've recovered, but that mental aspect of jumping over yeah. the steeple and yeah, of landing course. is a huge mental barrier, especially oh, with the yeah. Achilles, a lot of explosive movements. It can be a big mental barrier to try and cross. I know you mentioned um, uh, starting a family. So obviously mm-hmm. as a female athlete, there's particular sacrifices that you have to make that maybe a male athlete doesn't unfortunately just how it is biology um yeah at what point do you think the sacrifice of your career is no longer worthwhile the sacrifice of a family because you know there's always that societal pressure regarding children and I'm not sure how your family is, but whether they're always asking or whatever. Oh, they're, maybe. they're desperate. They're desperate. <laughs> exactly they're putting right. the most pressure on me. Yeah. <laughs> See? And that's the thing is it's not as easy for a female to try and achieve, um, you know, a success in their mm-hmm. athletic career because there's always that sacrifice of kids. And I know um, I had listened to a podcast of yours. And you were saying that if you weren't an, a, an Olympian, you'd be a mum of five, just try to start a basketball yeah, team. Yeah. So that's a big <laughs> sacrifice you have to make. Yeah. Um, at what point is that something now that you're at 32 and things like that you're thinking about, or is that something a bit more in the future? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm always, I've been thinking about a family since I was probably about 20. Like I I have always, I come from a big family. I um, am very maternal. I just, um, I love babies. So it has (laughs) been, an urge. I've I've, I've fought it for some time, Um, but no, it's, it's, it's on my mind, but I also don't, feel that when I decide to have kids I have to end my career I really pick some role models um, that have done both you know obviously when you have a child there's going to be a year there where you're out of action yeah Um, but I can name so many women off the top of my head that have had a baby and bounce back you know just as good if not better um, you know months later so at some point, yes, I will completely hang up my shoes and decide that my time as an athlete is done. And all I want to do is, you know, mother my children mm-hmm. and, and work on my side business. But I think for now, I do see that I can have both and I will attempt over the next 10 years to have both. Um, and as, I mean, that's another reason why marathon is, mm-hmm. is so tempting because that's where mothers go is to the marathon. The, there's so much evidence showing that um, having kids, it, it makes you stronger. Um, and there's plenty of, of evidence in Australia alone that shows that. So, um, I want my cake and eat it too. So <laughs> <Don't we laughs> and I'm going to have that. Yeah. No, I'll enough. just have to have a very, very supportive, like. <laughs> um, family around me that will just right. travel to the races and do all the babysitting. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, speaking about family, when you were growing up, how was that? I know that it seemed like you had a bit of a strict family on terms mm-hmm. of diet and things like that. Do you think you would be the same parent that your parents were? You turned out half decent to be fair. So yeah. they're doing a good job. How do you think yeah, you would th- change your parenting style? Thanks. I, um, I do like 
give my parents a lot of credit in the sense mm. that there's so many things they did parenting growing up where I thought they were absolutely crazy and it was frustrating to be their daughter. Um, but that was more because half the time I thought being a normal or a normal mm. kid was the cool thing. But really, if I look back and see all the opportunities that I was given because my parents were so driven, um, I'm so lucky and it is the reason why I'm the person I am today. I think the hardest part for when I become a mum is finding that balance between, you know, I don't want to be too pushy, but I also want to be driven um, for my kids when they mm. don't know when the right time to make the right decision is. And I know for me, especially all the way up until my, until I turned probably about 18, uh, there were so many times where I was trying to make the wrong decision and my parents mm. led me to the right decision. And my husband actually comes from a household that was very different. He was very motivated himself and he was always making the right decisions personally and, and um, intrinsically. But he had very supportive parents, but they didn't need to push him. They didn't need to tell him what to eat and what to do. Um, he did it all himself. So I feel like that's going to be a battle we have where <laughs> I'll be trying to, I'll be bringing out the vitamins and the green juice and he will be like, you're crazy. Um, it'll be a balancing all about act balance. It, all about balance. Yeah, I had one thing I have learned though is I don't think even our parents know what they're doing. Nah. So no, I think everyone's just sure. <laughs> yeah. I think everyone's out there just making their own rules. So mm. that's that's what I'll be doing. I think when I'm a mother. No, fair enough. I do know that you're talking about making sure that they're driven and things like that. I do mm -hmm. know that they essentially dragged you onto the plane for your college career. Literally. But yeah, like, kicking and screaming. <laughs> kicking and <you're> screaming. Right? <laughs> yeah. no, fair, cool. How do you think you would deal with that situation if you had, I guess, your child in the same? It, it's a tough balancing uh, act because obviously you want to push them yeah. to do what is best for them, but you don't want to make the decision for them and put them in a poor mental space. So how would yeah. you deal with that, you think? I think they're the decisions where I say I won't know what to do because I even asked my mom, like I've asked my mom well and truly after the fact, and there were times where, yes, they put me on the plane kicking and screaming, but at least for a parent, I think it was an easy one to force me in that situation because what I was getting into was a free education, mm. um, like paid for four years. My board was paid. My food was paid. I was completely looked after in a very like structured environment at college. Um, it was safe. They'd met the coaches and the academic advisors and they'd been and met everyone. So they were kind of handing me over almost to a boarding school and they knew that it was such a good opportunity. And even though I couldn't see it, they thought we have to make her do this. And then they came to the compromise with me that if I at least tried it for a year and I still was homesick and I was still crying myself to sleep, I could come home. And so that's how we ended up kind of, you know, coming to the middle ground where I was like, fine, I'll try it for a year. But then like, apparently, because it's probably all a blur for me. I was that traumatized for the first few nights. They dropped me off at college and drove home. I remember them driving down away and I was like, crying and waving at the same time for the next few nights they were in Orlando about to fly, fly home to Australia and I was Skype calling them every single night just continuously yes. continuously and after a while mum said we can't answer anymore we no, she's got it cool. she needs to grow up it's time and mum said to make a decision to like stop answering was the hardest thing for a mother that she's ever had to do I could imagine. that's that's when the doubt creeps in it's like yeah. what are we doing she's so upset you know this isn't right but I mean I got over it I ended up loving college and you couldn't get me home so they're going to be hard decisions mm -hmm. and at at some point I'm sure I'll question what I'm doing but um, I think as a parent deep down you have a gut feeling whether it's it's the right decision or not with what you're you know pushing your kid towards yeah. and I just hope that I have that instinct as as well as my parents did and it'll, you know hindsight's 2020 20, so you can only make the decision that you have you know in front of with the information you have in front of you so exactly. as, as it's with the best intention then whatever happens happens but i'm sure mm -hmm. it'll be all good and you got your, your husband you're saying that balances balances everything out he's also an yeah. elite runner how has that been balancing yeah. you know often you have in a partnership or a relationship you have one elite sportsman and then the other partner takes care of the domestic duties and things like that which allows mm -hmm. the the elite athlete just to perform and focus on their sport and their trade. How do you, how do you go about balancing two elite athletes? Is it difficult? I'd say early on the early few day or the early few years um, were really hard because mm. Ryan has been a professional athlete since he was about 18. Whereas wow. I was in college up until 22. 
Um, and then I ended up joining his group and, and racing professionally from about 2013. So the early years from like 2013 to 2015 were difficult because I feel like I'd met, met the most selfish human being in the world. <laughs> and he would say to me that like running is, you know, our job, it's our, um, you know, passion, it's everything, it's our livelihood, you know, that comes first. And I think I just struggled originally having a partner that put running first, mm. our relationship second. And even at the time, his points made sense and he wasn't irrational and, and telling me crazy things. But I was a typical girl that wanted, you know, what would you rather, um, you know, to be with me or a gold medal at the Olympics? <laughs> I, ex I expected me to be the answer. But at every the time, single time. At every the time, single time. I was, Disappointed every I time. <laughs> but I think as people, we really um, grew together and evolved. And, um, you know, he says I'm the most selfless person that he's ever met, but it's only because I learned, you know, how professional he was. I, I learned so much off him. He's the reason why I was able to make three Olympics because I realized, you know, I was running, but I wasn't really taking advantage of this, um, you know, blessing that I had to be a professional athlete and, and travel around the world together and, and compete in all these foreign cities and go to the Olympics. So I kind of used his ruthlessness and, and got better and more professional, but then he realized in a relationship, there is a give and take and, you know, he couldn't just be working and, and out for one person. There was mm -hmm. both of us in it. And we actually, by 2016, we were like a really good team. We still are. And I mean, we had a great 2016 season together. We both ran so well at the Olympics and we now have our roles. Like I am more domesticated. Like yeah. I am the cooker, the cleaner. Um, I do a lot of stereotypical female duties, but only because I love to, I am a caring yeah. person. I'm, I'm very motherly. Everyone in the group that I've traveled with for years now say that I'm like the mother hen. Um, but he, he does all the jobs I don't want to do. Like he'll take the gar <laughs> he'll take the garbage out and, and kill, the, kill the insects that are floating around. Um, but no, we, we honestly make a really good team and I wouldn't have come this far without him. And, and like I said, when I laid in that water pit, the, the first and only person that popped in my head was, was Ryan because he's been on this journey. I mean, he's massaged my Achilles in my calf every, every step of the way. And, um, you know, to not be able to have him at the Olympics this time was tough, but mm. um, I think we have a lot more in the future ahead of us because he also is um, still running and hopefully eventually we'll drift into the longer distances as well. As well. And we've just started a business together. Nice. Um, yeah, we're just a really good team, and I can say that wholeheartedly. The business was the um, the Gregson running, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah we've beautiful. just we launched it a week ago. Beautiful. Was that something that's been in the pipeline for a while, or yeah, beautiful. Yeah, it we we thought about it. I mean, last year with COVID and and sponsorship kind of really suffering all around the world, a lot of people lost their contracts immediately. We obviously were lucky enough to. Um, signed with Puma after 2020, but we kind of got to that point with our running career where we thought it's too scary to rely on just your running mm -hmm. to um, be your sole income. And we, we know so much about running. We know it inside out. It's so easy for us to coach running mm. and so many people out there we found were so interested in hearing a little bit more of the science behind training. And so pretty much at the start of this year, um, after the year of COVID, we thought, you know, let's, let's kind of slowly develop a business plan where um, by post Olympics, we can launch it and, and stop worrying about um, whether we're going to get a shoe contract or not, or whether we're mm -hmm. performing or not, or whether we're um, making prize money and let's have our own business that we can rely on and we're passionate about. And that's exactly what we've ended up doing. And we're a weekend now and loving it and awesome. have, you know, other ideas to grow a little bit more. Is <clears throat> Where would you like to take it then? You've got those ideas maybe in a year or two years time. Is yeah. there a particular, you know, benchmark you're looking for? Or where, where do you see Gregson running in a couple of years time? Yeah, I think with with originally with Gregson running, we have kind of capped it in the sense that we're offering a lot of our personal time. Like we call awesome. our clients, we speak with them, we have a WhatsApp um, oh, open nice. line communication. Yeah, so they can text us. We have like three Americans at the moment. So the time difference is a little difficult, <laughs> but, you know, it just allows them to, if they have any questions, to shoot them through. Um, you know, it's it's like a mentor 
mm. sort of role as well. And um, we're helping them on their journey. And, and a lot of them, they're not athletes. They're just people that want to lower their 5K time or eventually be able to do a half marathon or a marathon. And so it is time consuming and there's, mm. there is a limit on how many people we can take on for that reason. However, we're adding in um, another tier where we can create individualized programs. It's just the less one-on-one -on -one communication. Yeah. Um, so that'll be the next thing that we launch. But a big thing that I'm passionate about and I'm hoping to get it done in the next month is um, we want to do kids clinics at least one day a nice. month, every Beautiful. month. Yeah. And that'll just be, um, we'll take like 20 to 30 kids, um, depending on if I have helpers and just teach them the fundamentals of running and, and little tricks of the trade, maybe stretching drills, um, we'll play some games, um, you know, we'll give them signed gear. And it's more just um, like a half day of, of kids getting to come and train with Olympians and um, yeah, just create a cool environment for them to want to be more active, want to join mm. little athletics and just encourage the younger generation coming through. Definitely. I guess I get more eyes to the sport as well in terms of athletics because yeah. obviously with the, with the Olympics, everyone is, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're zoned into the Olympics and they're supporting the athletes and athletics, but outside the Olympics, when it's just the season, you guys aren't getting as much of a no. uh, recognition for things, which could, do you find that quite frustrating or would you like yeah. that to be a bit different? Yeah, because really for athlete, or for athletics, there's a major, some sort of major championship every single year. You know, we have the Olympics every four years. We have Commonwealth Games in between that every four years. And then in between those two major championships, we have um, world champs, which mm. is the Olympics. It's just athletics. So the caliber is still as high. The competition is really tough, but the general public don't even know we're over there competing half the yeah. time. Um, so it's just, it's just a, a low profile sport that um, is surprising to me because I mean, what kid doesn't do little athletics? That's in exactly Australia? right. You know, it's so popular. That's where all our footy players probably started. That's mm. where all our cricket players probably started. You know, it is the core basis of, of every athlete in this country pretty much. Um, and I just think that in general athletics, you know, it, it is single-handedly one of the most important things for our kids. And a lot of them are being driven away because they, they're like, you know, what, what famous track and field athlete is there? Yeah. There's none, you know, I want to be, I want to do something else. Uh, so we would like to change that and maybe having kids come along, will just show them that, you know, it is a cool sport and there is a lot to achieve in it. And the Olympics are in 2032 in Brisbane. Like yeah, it's that's a cool huge. opportunity. Yeah. It's massive. And like you were saying, a lot of you know, little athletics, the skills that you learn, and that is transferable to so many other sports. Yeah. Um, so yeah. do you think, what do you think more can be done to try and encourage little mm -hmm. athletics and more coverage of athletes? Is there more, what do you think can be done on your, on a, I think, I think a, a big one that would, honestly have such an impact is having athletics on television we yeah do not have it it is so hard to even find a live feed sometime to just watch if you want to like our olympic trials weren't even on television so mm -hmm. because it's not a known sport people don't even come to watch in the stadiums because no one even knows about it um and athletics can be so interesting if it's done right um i think the problem is in general like an athletics competition it can be strung out over four or five days and there's a lot of time in between events that you know we lose the interest of the crowd um but even if they could just for example video the olympic trials and make highlight packages that last 90 minutes where you're mm. just cutting out the the boring things and then putting it together and putting it on at prime time on a saturday or a sunday night kids then watch that and they then find role models and then that motivates them to want to be that um, right now kids are not seeing athletics on television no. so it's not appealing to them um, and and then with that comes sponsors athletics australia um, you know or a government a government funded organization but we don't really have many outside sponsors because sponsors don't see the point no. you know why why would we dump money into a sport that's not even on television um, so yeah, the, it, it, I just think the core of it comes from it not being on television. And even if you can't play the whole competition, I, I do think highlight packages will just shine a bit of interest. I don't know if you remember Nitro. Did you remember Nitro in 2017? Mm -hmm. They did a Nitro athletics in Melbourne and it was pretty much a TV production. It was awesome. They had Usain wow. Bolt the core, oh, as the wow. core of it. Yeah. Maybe and then I they had, so, yeah. 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 So then they had team Australia and they brought in athletes from all over the world to create different teams. There was like New Zealand, there was Australia. 
um, there was Great Britain. But anyway, they did this like game show and it was athletics with a twist. So yeah. there were events of that from athletics, but they all had like a bit of a game show sort of feel to them. Um, and it went for a week. There were three episodes that were over seven days and it was so fun. And we got a crowd. We got lots of viewing on television. It was on Channel 7. Um, it was. It's hard to redo that. We had useless yeah. fault. Um, but yeah. I just think you could start somewhere and, and do something. Definitely. It seems like you're quite passionate about the longevity and the future of athletics. Has your passion yeah. changed throughout your career? Because I could imagine, like you were saying, your husband was quite ruthless to begin with, and that's something you had to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and he was intrinsically motivated. Do you find your passions change throughout your career? Because obviously, like you were mentioning as well, in terms of making this a career, you have to perform and you have to get the prize money with performing. And it's quite a high pressure mm -hmm. situation to be in. Mm -hmm. Does that ever cause you to feel a bit disarrayed with the sport or is that something that continues to drive you on? Yeah, I think early on, um, I obviously had a completely different mindset because I was just an amateur um, thrown into the world of athletics and probably expected it to be um, a lot easier, I guess. Mm. And the more and more I was on the circuit and racing with professional athletes and against, against the best in the world, I did get disheartened for a while because I mean, there's, there's just as many drug cheats in athletics as there is in cycling. Mm. Like it's, it's, it's really renowned. Um, so I was getting frustrated at little things like Ooh. that. You know, when I, when I finish a race in the year later, you find out that someone that won was, you know, done for drugs. Yeah. So I think just in that mindset, um, once upon a time, I probably was looking for more of the um, external motivations mm. to make me want to turn up and do this job. But very quickly, I realized I actually genuinely love what I do. I honestly consider myself extremely lucky. You know, That's I awesome. don't sit at a desk from nine <laughs> to five. I, I do get to run as a job or rehab now as my job. Um, I've traveled around the world. I met my husband. I honestly have had one of the most exciting last 10 years of my life. And like I, I said, actually in an Instagram post after I ruptured my Achilles, um, you know, I had a lot of people reaching out and being like, you must be so devastated. You must just want to leave the sport. You must be so frustrated um, for all of that work to result to nothing. And yeah. the, it's not the nothing crazy though, thing is, is it? no. <laughs> it's not nothing. Not nothing. <laughs> um, but you realize very quickly that, like I said, I can look back and think, firstly, I did a massive job to even get to that final in the state mm. that my Achilles was in. Like I was just in a bad place. Um, you know, even though I trained for those five years, they weren't <laughs> grueling and miserable. I loved every step. Um, I achieved goals that I, I never could have imagined. I won races. I lost races. I, you know, battled through injury. I overcame injury and it isn't that I'm not driven by the financial aspect or gain. No. Um, I don't need medals and I don't need, um, you know, a top eight finish at the Olympic games to justify why I do this. And I think when you're at this level in any sport, you need to be doing it for yourself because mm. if you're doing it for any other reason, it's just not sustainable because mm. things aren't always going to fall your way. Now and then you're going to hit adversity. That was just pure bad luck. And if you're, you're doing it for anything other than yourself, you, you will run into a wall and think, what am I doing? I don't love this. I don't enjoy it. And it's, it's not my thing. So um, I'm lucky that I had that change in mindset early on. Um, because now I can thoroughly say, I love, I love yeah. my job and, you know, I do want to be the best again. Mm. Yeah. But if I'm not the best again, I'll, I'll still run. I'll keep running. I'll be a 60 year old trying to do a park run and break 40 <laughs> minutes. Like it'll, that'll be me. And I'll be breaking 80 minutes if I'm lucky. To <laughs> that park run. Um, yeah. Talking about the Olympics, I guess, like you were saying, it's four years build up or five years in this case. Mm -hmm. and you're this seems like you're quite intrinsically motivated you're not motivated motivated by the medals and things like that mm -hmm. had how, how did you get to that point because I could imagine for a lot of athletes this is the premier event you know all eyes <clears throat> are on mm -hmm. them for that event and there's so mm -hmm. much pressure not just from themselves but family members and you know the general population that a lot of time if they don't you know, place or they don't get a medal, whatever it may be, yeah. but they're considered a failure, even though quite clearly they're making the Olympics, they're not much of a failure. Mm -hmm. How did you get yeah. to that point? And how did you, how do you feel mentally that you're able to deal with those pressures that maybe not internally, but externally from family or yeah. um, the public? 
I learned that one off my husband, I think, because he um, told me, you know, back in his heyday of, of when he was 18, 19, he was, you know, the one of the fastest, um, you know, younger, young kids in the mm. world, really. Um, wow. He had broken the Australian record. He was, um, you know, a potential medal at the Commonwealth Games. There was just a lot going his way and everyone was on the bandwagon. Even, you know, you're getting a lot of funding, you're getting prize money, you're getting sponsorship money. You got a lot of fans all of a sudden. Um, and after he broke the Australian record, he woke up the next morning and he actually um, had a snapped navicular, well, a, a fractured navicular and couldn't even run a step. Um, and, you know, the rest of the year with Com Games coming up and, and Continental Cup coming up, it all just went to nothing and he had mm -hmm. to go home and, and start cross training. And over the next five years, um, you know, it was just unlucky. He kept trying to get back, he'd break, get back, break. And over five years of that, he realised by the end of the five years, you know, your sponsors have left mm -hmm. you, your fans are gone, um, you know, everything disappears and, and it's not anyone else's fault. They just want to be on the next thing that's exciting. and. He found it hard to like deal with the fact that it was so um, driven by, yeah, by yeah. all this like, external factors, mm. you just become nothing and disposable so quickly. And he just thought, you know, I'm never going to care about the money side of things or the prizes or the medals or the times. Um, I'm going to, you know, set my own goals and, and stay driven for myself because that's the only thing that's going to be there every step of the way, whether I'm hurt or not. And I remember him telling him telling me that story. And I, at first I kind of probably, I was young and I would have just thought, oh, that's a bit bitter, <laughs> you know, how gloomy, but <laughs> I totally easy, mate, get geez. it. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it's all right. <laughs> Um, but I, I fully understand it now, mm. not in a necessarily a negative way. It just, it's, it's got to be your own, um, doing to, to do what we do and, and you can't rely on all the external pressures of, of going to the Olympics and performing so that everyone's happy, you know, you did that or that there's more TV time on you, mm. or there's an article being written about you because, that's why a lot of athletes struggle when the Olympics is over and you wake up and you're a normal person again. I mean, of course, you'll always be an Olympian, but when you're no longer on the television, there's no more Olympic talk. Everyone goes back to their day jobs. Um, people struggle mm. um, that the hype is over because they're like, now what? And I've never felt that. I mean, the Olympics are amazing and they're a huge hype and it, the adrenaline does get going, but when the Olympics are over, I'm ready for the next goal. I'm more motivated than ever. Mm. Um, I'm like, wow, that was fun. Let's go again. Let's do something. Um, and I think if you don't have that mindset, you will struggle with that period after Olympics where it's almost a lull and, yeah. and you forget what your worth is. And you're kind of like, what now? You know, I don't know what to do with my life. No. So yeah. It's all driven it from an external place. source. So mm -hmm. if you're always looking for external sources to drive internal motivation or value, then it's always yeah. going to be difficult. Cause like you said, they move on with cycles and everything yeah. like that people move everyone on. moves on everyone yeah. moves there's on. always some young young you know new talent coming right. through that's going to draw the attention away no fair enough now obviously this olympics was a very difficult one to prepare for i could imagine you've been to a couple now the london mm -hmm. olympics which is crazy getting into that one and then rio which you did quite yeah. well um how did you feel preparing mm -hmm. for this olympics compared to the previous let's say rio for example with you know, everything that's, they're quite meticulous with their planning in terms of, you know, <clears throat> the training blocks and, you know, mm -hmm. deloading, everything like that, for that to be extended by a year. Physically, how did you feel for the events? I know you had a few injuries and then mentally refocusing and, you know, trying to, I guess, get your mental focus on another year time when you're yeah. competing. How was that process for you? Yeah, it's actually ironic when you look at all three of the Olympics, um, and how different they are. I mean, the first, the first Olympics I qualified late and I was pretty much just given my uniform last minute and thrown into the village. Um, so I didn't have much time to prepare for that one in general. I just kind of rode the wave of emotion and excitement and had a grand old time. Um, Rio, uh, things kind of just went perfectly in the sense that I was healthy. I was getting faster every race. I was PBing every time I touched the track and, and rolled right through Rio and then beyond. Um, you know, I just had one of those dream seasons mm -hmm. where it's, I guess they call it your purple patch where everything was just working out for me. With Tokyo, um, if you, you know, take me back to 2016, all the way to 2021, I mean, it was a, it was a roller coaster to say the mm. least. Um, pretty much 2017 onwards, I had 
every injury under the sun, just changing brands with, with the shoes that I run in and um, rushing back to try and make the home Commonwealth Games and then, you know, breaking my foot again. There was just like a lot going on. And, and that's probably where I've been tested the most in my career, even more so mentally than now. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And 2019, that, I had, I think in 2019, I had one of those injuries that was so nagging and I was in yeah. pain all the time that it really wears at your mental mm. health because you're in pain all the time and it's crippling. And I kind of got to a point where I was running terribly. Mm. I was getting absolutely no results. I you know, wasn't being told what was wrong with my foot. And then finally I got to a, a breaking point where I got it like scanned and checked out. And yeah, finally they were like, Oh, you've, you've torn your Achilles at the insertion. So <laughs> It was when I found out that diagnosis, I was almost relieved because I'm yeah. like, Good, I can't run another step. I'm, no. I'm in agony. But do you think, um, did you ever, did the, the thought of leaving the sport ever cross your mind during those? Uh, yeah, I would say injuries? that one time in 2019 yeah. was the one time I think it's the closest I've ever been. Um, really, it's it's the only time I've ever yeah. felt like this isn't for me. No. Um, you know, I've had my time, but the, fortunate thing is I just kept thinking Tokyo is one year away I'll be mm -hmm. so devastated if I retire and sit on a couch and watch Tokyo um, from a couch and I'm just I'm not ready to do that and I think that's why I was able to make the decision pretty quickly to not quit is my husband was like you've got one decision to ask yourself you know there's we don't need to write out pros and cons of running we don't need to go ask for every single person's opinion mm -hmm. or, or ask doctors what they think you just need to ask yourself one question and it is you know are you willing to quit what's the alternative do mm. you go get a job or do you keep going and and get healthy and, and keep running and when you put it so simply like that I knew I didn't want to quit and I just thought I'll have to do whatever it takes to get healthy again and it was a really long road it was you know four months of barely walking and, mm. and progressing from there but that brought me to, um, you know, end of 2019, I made world champs and came 10th. And I thought, right, you know, by Tokyo, I'm, I'm aiming for that top eight, maybe top six. And it wasn't till COVID hit in March, 2020, that really knocked me about um, because I was going so well and I was finally healthy. Mm. It's super frustrating for someone that spent their whole career injured and then they're finally healthy and the, the Olympics <laughs> is postponed. But um, in hindsight, it was a blessing, even though I ended up rupturing my Achilles, I was still 10 times the athlete by 2021 than I may have been um, by August, 2020. And that year was a bit rocky for me, just mentally. Um, I did struggle to maintain motivation um, of the thought that the Olympics could be canceled. There was so yeah. much talk in the media of it not even going on. Um, I went easy on myself through, through COVID year. I kind of just thought, um, I know what I'm capable of. I know I'm yeah. tough, but right now my body's telling me to um, chill out and just get the K's in. Don't put any pressure on yourself. Oh. Um, enjoy this moment with family. And then, you know, by 2021, when it's Olympic year again, we refocus. And that's what I did. And I think I did it perfectly because by 2021, my first race of the season was also my one road race. And from then on, I um, started to really progress. I did some PBs. Um, and things were moving perfectly for me to have my best Olympics yet. And I went into the Olympics with the mentality that it would be my, my mm. best finish ever and that I'd re-break my Australian record. And I had all these goals that I was definitely capable of. Um, and that, and that's why I don't, I don't regret a thing. No, I I've, did everything perfect. It's right. just, it's one of those days where it wasn't meant to be. That's exactly right. Unfortunately, on your birthday as well of all days. <laughs> Yeah. What can you do though? I could imagine it would have been quite difficult to deal with the uncertainty of not knowing whether the Olympics was going forward. Um, mm -hmm. And even in the state that the Olympics was, obviously it still went forward, but it was in a complete different uh, mm -hmm. format, I guess you could say with no crowds and everything like that. How yeah. did you feel regarding yeah. no crowds and, you know, you couldn't have as much of a support system there as you could in previous Olympics. Was that something yeah. that allowed you to focus more or was that a bit more of a distractor, do you think? Yeah, like, of course, I would have loved my family to come. Like, everyone on both my side of the family and my husband were fully booked and ready to go. They'd bought tickets to every event. Um, you know, it was going to be a massive celebration. Mm. And when that all fell through and everyone kind of decided that no one was going, um, I I'm probably was, like, a bit upset at first. But at the same time, my husband and I always laugh and we say, we don't know why our family spends their one holiday of the year coming and watching us compete because we're no fun. We can't do anything. <laughs> can't do we're anything. in the... Yeah, if we're in the Design. Olympic Village, yeah. yeah, preparing for like one of the biggest races in our life, what could we possibly do to like contribute to a fun party in Tokyo? So 
as much as selfish as it sounds, I didn't mind that as much. And I knew they would all be glued to the television in Australia, watching every move, but um, the, the no crowds and everything, that's been the main question I've been asked, I would say since Tokyo. And honestly, it, as an athlete at that level, you're focused on so much else. You know, you're focused on your body, on any injuries you might be holding, on your race, on your competitors, um, the time of day you're racing, is it hot? You know, how's this race going to be run? That when you're walked out to that track and it's the last thing less, in mind. yeah, it's mm. a lot, lot more silent than, than normal. It's, it, you're not looking up being like, oh, where is everyone? This is strange. This is such a weird experience. You're kind of just thinking this is the Olympics. Oh my gosh, it's finally here in X amount of minutes. This is all behind me. I can't believe it. Who would have thought we'd have the Olympics during COVID? Like, there's so many mm. other thoughts. And um, I think the Olympic community and all the countries did such a great job to let the Olympics go ahead. I mean, it would have been heartbreaking for athletes if it didn't, um, you know, people pause their life for yeah. the Olympics and um, a lot of athletes that are at the Olympics aren't even full-time athletes. So um, I think that they definitely made the right decision and um, we're grateful for it because it really, it was a good Olympics. It was as good as it could have been. Definitely. And I think, you know, a lot of people are in lockdown at that time in Australia and things like that. So it yeah. gave a lot of people a source of entertainment yeah. and a lot of joy to see, you know, our athletes do quite well because we did quite well this um this Olympics. Yeah. Run me through, I guess, your mentality. You're stepping up to race in a final on mm. the biggest stage in your sport. You know, everyone's watching at home. You know, everyone's watching in Australia, essentially. How do you feel? Because I couldn't imagine, like, my, as I'm talking about this, I'm getting nervous. So how did you, how do you <laughs> feel? You know, I, I know it's a bit of a tactical race as well. Are you thinking about the mm-hmm. tactics? Are you just wanting to race and put your best performance in? Let me, let me, you know, go through the head of Genevieve uh, yeah. for a race. I think there's so many different um, mindsets that you can be in, and I've experienced all the kinds. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when I think back to London, I woke up again, it was on my birthday, the race, I woke up in the morning at like 6am because I had a, a morning race. And I couldn't even comprehend or express what I was feeling like it was kind of like you explained, it was nerves, it was being overwhelmed, it was excitement, it was disbelief. And I think I videoed myself on the balcony in the village and just tried to like speak words to explain what I was <laughs> feeling so that I never forgot that moment. I was like, I never want to forget this feeling ever, ever again. Wow. Um, and it was, it was, it was spectacular. It was a fairy tale. It was awesome. By the time, like if you fast forward four years where now I've got a little more expectations on, on myself, um, you know, I had a goal that I would have been disappointed if I didn't hit. Um, Rio was different. It was probably more negative nerves. I remember probably being a bit drained because I was um, just scared. I was yeah. scared of not fulfilling, not fulfilling the goals that I'd set. And I kept thinking, you know, if I don't make the final, that's a failure. I have to make the final. I'm capable of making the final. You know, if something happens to prevent that, I'll be really devastated. And so the nerves were, I ended up seeing a sports psych a few days before my race for that reason, because I felt they weren't good nerves. Mm. I think there are good nerves and there's bad nerves. These were negative ones where I kept thinking of what if this doesn't happen instead of, oh, you know, if I do what I'm supposed to do, I'll run really well. And so Rio was, was hard like that. But once I did my first race, um, it just all turned into excitement because I'd, I'd made the final and fulfilled my one goal for the championship and everything after that was a bonus. So then I ran really free and, and enjoyed every moment. Then leading into Tokyo it was different again because I was managing an injury and I actually hadn't gone into an Olympics before with a niggle. Um, so this made it hard because it was just absorbed everything. You know, I was seeing the medical team morning and night. We were doing everything we could to make sure that I was in the best situation as possible because a month prior I, I'd done a race and shown that, yeah, I was in top six shape um, mm. if all went well and the medical team were trying to just help me stay there. So I had Ryan on the phone mentally trying to keep me positive. I had the medical team trying to keep me physically positive. Um, so that, that absorbed everything. So mm. I can't say that I was like that sickly nerve and not even that type of nervous where I was putting pressure on myself. It was more like, Oh gosh, I hope my foot can hold yeah, on. Like yeah. if my foot holds on, I'm good to go. Yeah. So when I got through the final, I remember calling Ryan so happy and so excited. I think I texted my family too, because I said to them, 
oh my gosh, thank God I made it. Like mm-hmm. my foot held up. Everything's going to be okay. Now that I'm in the final, I'm going to run really free. Everything will be fine. And my husband and I, we're, we did a little celebration before the final because we're like, the fact that you made the final and you were in, you know, that bad away mentally with, with your foot, yeah. I think you're going to do awesome in the final. And then obviously that all crumbled. But it was a weird Life experience. Comes to you yeah, fast, I, I, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. But, but what's nice is I don't remember at any point saying, Oh, I hope I run well so that people aren't disappointed. Yeah. You know, oh, oh, everyone's watching. Make sure you perform. I didn't have one thought like that. And I am glad because I'm not there to, to put on a show. No. I'm honestly there to achieve what I've put hours and days and years into achieving. So in terms of running with an injury, like you were saying, all the focus is on that injury. Is there a part of you that thinks, you know, because I've got that injury, anything any performance that I, I put out there is a positive because at the end of the day, technically yeah. I really, you know, I could easily pull out from the event and no mm-hmm. one would say a thing because I'm injured. So anything that I put you know, any performance I put in is a positive. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I thought in my heat, I thought more like that. I mm-hmm. mean, I knew I was probably, I was probably in a worse way in my heat just because mentally I didn't know if I was capable of making the Mm. distance just with my foot. But when I did that first round, I was like, oh, I'm fine. I can make it. I just did it. Um, So yes, a part of me was proud that I also tried to keep it to myself. You know, I didn't waltz around telling people I was injured. I wasn't putting on my Instagram. Hey, everyone, I'm racing in the Olympics, but don't, don't expect much. I'm hurt. Um, you know, it was something that I kept close to my chest um, because I wanted to give myself every chance. I didn't want an out. I didn't want an excuse. Um, you know, I remember even doing my post-race interview and and the interviewee was like, um, oh, you know, you you didn't seem yourself. It must have been the heat. You obviously aren't good in the heat. And I'm like, yeah, I guess interviews, that's I'll it. tell you what, do you get sick of these some of these interviews? Because they put a mic straight in your face. You have no time to process the race <laughs> yeah. and they're asking you all these questions. Yeah. I mean, it is, it is the hardest time to be interviewed, but at the same time, I would have been that happy that I was through. So I just was like, yeah, the heat was killer. Um, (laughs) But you know, in my head, I'm thinking if only you knew what I was dealing with a day ago. Um, So I, I mean, pulling out and and not competing was never an option. So I think for me, I was, yeah, proud of myself for getting out there and just getting by and and compartmentalizing and trying to push to the back of my mind that I was injured. I think that says a lot about just me personally, and I'm proud of that, but um, I just wish I could have pulled it off in the final. Well, it just uh, leaves you for a, a great comeback into the marathon running. It'd be a great story. Yeah, I'll, tell you what, I'll tell you it what. It will. Now you've, let's run through that Olympic final. You've jumped over the, uh, the hurdle or... I'm not sure what they call it, a hurdle? Yeah, hurdle or barrier. A hurdle Same barrier. Thing. And you've landed and obviously you've ruptured your Achilles. The first thing you think about is your husband. They, I've mm-hmm. seen, you know, I watched the race live and I saw them wheeling you away in the wheelchair, you know, mm-hmm. a head in your hands. What's going through your head? Yeah. What's the second thing that you're thinking? Um, I think kind of like I explained to you earlier, that as soon as I fell, like that that snap and that shot, um didn't take me a millisecond to work out what had happened. Um, I think to me, it was obvious just, even though it was my good Achilles, it was the Achilles that is my reliable one. It still was like the drop of the pin sort of moment where you're like, yep, that's my right Achilles saying Mm. I can't carry your body anymore. But, you know, I reached around and and felt my Achilles and felt that it was a hundred percent ruptured. And there was so many thought, like I said, the first one was my husband because I knew he was watching live and he was doing like um, kind of like post-race comments on mm. the radio. And I'm like, oh, he's going to be on live radio dealing with this. This is horrible. Be rough. But I think during the time of them wheeling me uh, to the medical room, I was distraught. Like if I think back now, it's embarrassing because the amount of people that would have heard me crying, like I wasn't doing the soft, cute, <laughs> just petite cry. Everything it was out. like... <laughs> It was like one that you can make a meme out of. Um, Um, I was wailing, but nothing was pain related. Yeah, nothing. I don't even think I felt my foot. I remember actually thinking, why isn't this hurting? Like I ruptured Mm. my Achilles. Um, I was just heartbroken to every inch of my body because I knew what, what I'd done and what it meant. I obviously meant that I couldn't finish the race. I had to DNF. So at the end of the day, the 2021 
3000 meter women's steeple will say Genevieve Gregson DNF. And I hate like that killed me. And then secondly, I just, I thought of all those things that I said earlier, where you put in so much, um, you jeopardize a lot. I mean, you sacrifice a lot. You, you jeopardize relationships. You, um, like my husband had pretty much put his career on hold this year when he wasn't traveling well to make the Olympics, to make sure that I could be the best I could be, um, Mm -hmm. and fulfill the goals that we had set. Um, I thought of, you know, being away from home years on end away from my family and missing weddings and birthdays and, Honestly, all these thoughts are just pulling and you're just thinking, and for what, for a ruptured yeah. Achilles on the water barrier. But these were just all those, the most negative thoughts you could possibly have just flowing one by one. And I was just crying and thinking, this is literally the worst case scenario. Um, it's heartbreaking. But but yeah, I had I had those thoughts for a while and, and I would cry at the drop of a hat. Just if anyone said, how are you doing? It was like, Jeez, not good. Away. Yeah. Not great, mate. Not yeah. great at all. So <laughs> yeah, I avoid talking to like humans <laughs> for a really long time for that reason um but i it is amazing how i have been able to put it in perspective for something that was so heart-wrenching once um i can talk about freely now without yeah. i mean i still i still get sad and if i really went into depth i'm sure i could make myself cry on this podcast right now but i the floor um, is yours Genevieve. <laughs> yeah, yeah i do feel that i am um really just lucky in the life I have and it's not the end of me um you know maybe if I did believe it was the end and I was ready to quit uh, it would be sad that that's how I went out after all these years but I think because I know I'm not done and and I feel like this will be a great story to mm. look back on um you know I'm able to just erase those terrible minutes and days of being in Tokyo alone in a cast thinking what have I done um you know I've, I feel like I'm slowly blacking it out of my memory and it'll just be a distant event that happened once in the past <laughs> no, I couldn't I personally couldn't imagine all those uh, emotions and feelings that you would have felt straight after an injury like that because obviously mm-hmm. you know the Achilles is is a difficult injury to rehab from but considering your life story and all the sacrifices that you made I'm sure that like we were saying this is a springboard for a, an amazing return and talking about those sacrifices you're saying that you spent a lot of time away from your family obviously went mm-hmm. to America for college and yeah. and missing friends weddings and things like that how did you feel doing that because obviously it can be a lonely road at the top mm-hmm. you know when you're yeah. an elite athlete and people see the glitz and glamour at the Olympics, you see the interviews and things like that, yeah. but they don't see you waking up at whatever time to train mm-hmm. twice a day, the injuries and things like that. How do you go about with those sacrifices? Yeah, I think like, the, especially with social media, that mm-hmm. that is a massive point that um, you made is it does look glamorous yeah. um, for elite athletes, for any of them, even the gold medalists, like it, you, you sit back and think, oh, I wish I was them but it's never as it seems. There's so much to put in and just me alone. And and I'm not a gold medalist. Um, The sacrifices I've had to make are huge and lucky for me. I I mean, I have three brothers and we're all very close in age. They do not have a jealous or envious bone in their body for what I do. Um, they're, They're proud of me and they think that like the life I chose is amazing, but they also you know, openly say we would have never, ever done that. Like there's no way you could have made us leave home at 18 and, and do the life you do now. But I'm lucky that my family see it for what it is. They see me chasing my dreams. And I think a lot of people could sit back and think, oh, it's selfish. The life we live, you know, we, we pretty much leave everyone behind. I can't be at my best friend's wedding. I can't be there for the birth of, you know, a friend's child, but my support system is so good to me. And and when I come home, it's a huge celebration. And when I leave, it's tears and it's sad, mm-hmm. but we just do that every year. And um, I, I feel like I'm really glad that at no point has someone made me feel like I should be somewhere when, when mm-hmm. I've missed it. And I mean, half the time I have a good excuse. It's Commonwealth Games or it's the Olympics mm-hmm. or it's World Champs, but I'm just grateful that I've had a support system that haven't made me feel like, you know, I selfishly have missed a lot of their lives. Um, no one's ever said, made me feel that way. And they're just happy for us. They know it's a temporary lifestyle. Mm. You can't 
run for your country around the world forever. Um, I think they are, though, getting excited that the thought of me coming home for good is very near. Mm. But um, I don't, I don't give off any hints. I keep being like, yeah, I'll, I'll be back soon. I'll be keep out and guessing. running. Keep them yeah. guessing. Is that <laughs> yeah. something you are looking forward to moving back and having that support system there all the time? Yeah, of yeah. course. Like even just now, I'm in Queensland, um, and yeah, there will be a point where I'm here for good and I really look forward to it because, I mean, maybe it's a bit of a skewed or biased vision right now because we're still a hot commodity. You know, we're mm. in town. They don't know when we're leaving again, but um, everyone makes a big fuss of us when we're home, including my brothers. And um, there's always an occasion every second night. It's actually nice. tiring my husband out. Um, <laughs> that, uh, one day, a long way, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One day I will want to set roots and, um, you know, stop this nomadic lifestyle, just, you know, traveling around out of, out of a suitcase. Yeah. I could imagine it could be quite difficult at times and maybe they yeah. get, the goodbyes are getting harder and harder as you grow Mm -hmm. years and years yeah. go by i remember yeah. um, listening to a podcast of a podcast i think it was a video where you were saying one of the um superstitions you had when you were younger was carrying a leaf around <laughs> is that right <laughs> to every meet don't worry God. i'll do my research Genevieve. I'll you do have research. done some homework <laughs> i like right. don't even know where you're gathering all of this <laughs> Um, my college friends still give me grief about this. Yeah, I was, it was actually right when I was about to make my first Olympics. So I was still in college, it's 2012. And I had, yeah, a camera crew come and just ask me basic questions about my upbringing mm. and stuff. And they, one of the questions were, are you superstitious? And I was like, no, I gave up on being superstitious because back in high school, when I was like going to national cross country, I believed that if I carried this leaf around, I would run well because I'd run well every race that I'd brought it to. Like I had it like kind of packed in this really neat little box. Um, and then I went to nationals one year, had a stinker came like dead last it was really depressing and I remember the first thing I did is went and scrunched leaf. up that leaf and I was like stop relying on a leaf it's not the leaf um, so yeah I think I think the moral of that story was I sh probably shouldn't have told them about the whole leaf but I should have said I used to be superstitious and realized it didn't work <laughs> fair enough it makes you feel better when I used to play soccer I had shin guards that I'd wear from five onwards and then the one time I didn't wear them when I was 19 I played awful so I'm still relying <laughs> yeah, on that. It was the shin, <laughs> yeah, it was the shin guards. <laughs> definitely not my own performance. Um, but I guess from that story, there's things from your, you know, growing up and childhood that you've left. And then there's lessons that you've learned throughout the, mm -hmm. throughout the um, younger years. If you were to yeah. speak to an aspiring Olympian now, someone that's maybe, you know, going into the sport that you're in or any sport um, that's uh, representing the Olympics, what would you tell them? Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the thing that I, the one thing I feel like I've done right, right from day one is I kept it fun. And mm. it's the reason why I'm still here. Um, even though I did have pushy parents and I was always striving to be the best from a young age, I was always in an environment where I loved what I was doing. And whether that was having my brothers pace me for reps or I was, you know, running with a group of girls that I'd met in school and, you know, had the same love for running. I've always been in an environment that has looked after me in distance running and, you know, been a positive one that has made me love it and, and thrive. Even college, it was a girls team. Um, two of the girls became my bridesmaids. You know, <laughs> I lived with them. Yeah, they're just, I made pretty much all my friends, even to this day, are people I've met along this road of, of athletics and running. And it just shows that I was lucky enough to always make a decision to be around the right people. Um, because like you said, it's a lonely sport. It's an individual sport. It's not like being in a team where you can always rely on others around you. I mean, you're always out there on your own pretty much. So if you can continuously enjoy the environment you're in with training, whether it's your friends or your family, um, or, you know, you take up an opportunity to go to college, you pick a school that is, is going to be a good one for you. And you're going to be happy because if you're not happy doing any of this, um, it's just not sustainable. Right. And for an aspiring Olympian that wants to make it all the way, it has to be sustainable. And I think I've done that more than well enough because mm. I can't say there's been a stage in my life where I've hated what I'm doing. It's a very good thing to say. And like you were saying, all the things that you noted to make sure that they uh, achieve success in their sport is all intrinsic drivers. Nothing. Mm -hmm. It has to anything. be. Yeah, nothing you mentioned yeah. regards to medals or the fame that comes with it. No. If you were to say one thing to yourself when you were younger when you were six or seven mm -hmm. just starting on the journey because you didn't initially start with the sport you were playing a number of sports weren't you and then yeah you made your way into athletics at 13 14 yeah 
what piece of advice would you give younger Genevieve, you reckon? Um, like I said, I think I followed the perfect path, mm. but I would just tell myself to um, don't force any decisions, just go with your gut every time and um, listen to the people that love you most because they're going to always make the decisions right. Um, you know, no one's out to get you. I think no. there would have been some years in my teenage years where I thought my parents were out to get me. I would just convince her that, um, you know, everything happens for a reason and to enjoy the ride because you're heading places. Beautiful. And maybe tell her to get rid of the leaf a bit earlier. <laughs> yeah. Do not ever rely on a leaf. <laughs> not a good idea. Well, thank you very much for your time, Genevieve. It's much appreciated. I'm no, sure. Thank you for having me, me, Ali. No, my pleasure. I'm sure me amongst a lot of people will be looking forward to uh, Paris 2024 where we'll get yeah. to sit on the road, maybe with a yeah. few kids, who knows, running yeah, who knows? Much, very much appreciated <laughs> and um, have a lovely day.